In this episode of Dermatology Weekly, Dr. Vincent DeLeo welcomes guests to discuss guidelines on psoriasis treatment with phototherapy. And in the news, non-white patient participation in psoriasis trials. This is Dermatology Weekly, the official podcast of MDH Dermatology, Cutest Peer-to-Peer, and the Medscape Professional Network. I'm the host of the news portion of this program, Nick Andrews. Coming up in the peer-to-peer portion, Dr. DeLeo welcomes Dr. George Hahn and Dr. Jason Wu about the joint guidelines from the American Academy of Dermatology and the National Psoriasis Foundation for psoriasis treatment with phototherapy. They will provide tips for getting patients started on phototherapy, and they'll discuss different devices for at-home and in-office use. The peer-to-peer portion of the program will, of course, be coming up after the news. And if you'd like to jump ahead to the peer-to-peer portion, it starts around moment 10, 10 30, 11, somewhere in there if you want to skip in your player. And coming up in the news today, progress for women in leadership roles within pediatric dermatology, and we'll discuss the results of a Medscape survey regarding burnout and loneliness for physicians amid COVID-19. Remember, you can email Derm Weekly at podcasts at mdedge.com. You can follow us on Twitter at mdedgederm. If you have any ideas for how to improve the show or something that you'd like to see or hear please let us know. And we take feedback very seriously on Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and leave us a rating or review. Uh, Be honest with your rating. We're not necessarily asking for five stars, but uh, if you write a review, we do take those seriously. And they are, of course, discussed and and we, we use them to improve the show and have in the past. Okay, let's get to the news portion of the program. We begin today with data on non-white patients and their representation in psoriasis trials. Non-white patient participation in phase three therapeutic trials for plaque psoriasis is less than 15%. This is according to a recent analysis of data from the clinicaltrials.gov database. In the study, investigators broke down participation by race in all phase three plaque psoriasis trials that enrolled adults and had posted results by May 2020. Data from trials of medications yet to be approved were excluded from this research. The researchers reported that most trials were multinational. The medications evaluated included 11 biologics, 10 topicals, 2 oral systemic agents, and a phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitor. The 82 trials included in this analysis enrolled 48,000 patients collectively. From the trials that identified race, 85.8% of the 39,000 participants were white. 3% of 25,000 patients were black. 19.5% of 11,000 patients were Hispanic or Latino, and 9.2% of 30,000 patients were Asian. And fewer than 2% of participants were either Native American or Pacific Islander. Non-white patients remain underrepresented, even when recognizing differences in the prevalence of psoriasis. For example, one recent survey found the U.S. prevalence of psoriasis to be about half as great in blacks as it is in whites, at 1.9% versus 3.9%. However, the representation of blacks in the phase three trials evaluated by the investigators was more than 20 times lower. There are many reasons to suspect the lack of diversification in psoriasis trials and is impeding optimal care in those underrepresented. Of several examples offered by the authors, one involved differential responses to adalimumab among patients with hydronitis superbita with genetic variants of the BCL2 gene. But the authors reported racially associated genetic differences are not uncommon. The authors wrote that estimates have shown that approximately one-fifth of newly developed medications demonstrate interracial and or ethnic variability in regard to various factors, such as pharmacokinetics, safety, and efficacy profiles, dosing, and pharmacogenetics. We move now to progress for women in leadership roles within pediatric dermatology. New data show that women account for approximately 78% of pediatric dermatology workforce and continue to gain influence through increased numbers of leadership positions and published research. This is according to data from a review of professional society leaders, as well as grant recipients and annual meeting presenters from 2010 to 2019. The study was published originally in Pediatric Dermatology. In the study, researchers reviewed data on society leadership, research grants, and annual meeting speakers in order to evaluate the impact of women in pediatric dermatology. They report that overall, the Society of Pediatric Dermatology had had 20 women presidents since it was founded back in 1975. They also reported that seven of the last 10 presidents have been women. The Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance, founded in 2013, 
has had two co-chairs each year, and 75% of those have been women. The percentage of women as lead authors of published research in pediatric dermatology increased significantly from 1983 to 2019. 71% of first authors and 65% of senior authors of papers in the journal Pediatric Dermatology in 2019 were women. The researchers also found that 26 of the 31 physicians who received SPD PEDRA Pilot Project awards between 2008 and 2018 were women, as were 88% of similar team collaborative grant winners from 2016 to 2018. Despite all of this progress, lectures at annual meetings remain an area in which women are underrepresented. The investigators did note that the study findings were limited by a lack of data on non-binary genders and the possibility of error in assessing gender based on name and online profiles alone. However, the results suggest that women have increased their influence in pediatric dermatology through leadership and research, although a gender gap persists in roles as senior authors and named lecturers at meetings. And finally today, the Dermatology Weekly COVID-19 update. A recent Medscape survey found that there are high levels of loneliness, stress, and burnout in physicians during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can find the results of the survey in the show notes. There's a link there. Medscape is owned by the same parent company as Dermatology Weekly. Isolation and relationship stress add to this problem. Dr. Patrick Ross is a critical care physician at Children's Hospital in L.A., He was plagued with increasing worry about his health and that of his family, patients, and colleagues. While distancing from his wife and his daughter, he became terrified of falling ill and dying alone. He grew more anxious. Dr. Ross withdrew from family, colleagues, and friends, although his clinical and academic responsibilities were unaffected. He said he barely ate, his weight plummeted, and he began to have suicidal thoughts. His experience is indeed extreme, but according to the Medscape survey, his experience is not unique. The survey found that of the almost 7,500 physicians who were surveyed, about two-thirds of U.S. physicians reported experiencing more intense burnout, and 46% reported feeling more lonely and isolated during the pandemic. Dr. Christine Sinke is VP of Professional Satisfaction at the American Medical Association. She said that we know stress, which was already significant for physicians, has increased dramatically for many physicians during the pandemic. She added that physicians are stressed about potentially contracting the virus or infecting family members, being overworked and fatigued, witnessing gut-wrenching scenes of patients dying alone, grieving the loss of deaths, colleagues, or family members, and sometimes lack adequate PPE. In fact, the lack of adequate PPE has been identified as one of the most significant contributors to burnout and stress among physicians and other healthcare professionals. In all eight countries surveyed by Medscape, A significant number of respondents reported lacking appropriate PPE, either, quote, sometimes, often, or always when treating COVID-19 patients. And just over half of U.S. respondents said they were always adequately protected. The pandemic has prompted new situations that may not have been what particular doctors and healthcare professionals thought they'd be doing in their practice. The pandemic and subsequent medical response has led to more anxiety and increased challenges in personal and professional relationships. In response to this, some institutions have formalized a buddy system called the battle buddy model, which is a term that comes from the military. This involves clinicians of similar age, specialty, and general life circumstances relying on one another for support. Close to half of U.S. respondents in the Medscape survey reported that their workplace offers activities to help physicians deal with grief and stress, but 39% said their workplace does not offer something like that, and 18% reported being unsure if that was offered. For physicians seeking help, the physician support line is recommended. That number is 888-409-0104. Again, that's 888-409-0104. The complete survey data is available in a link in the show notes. Dermatology Weekly will be right back with Peer to Peer. Welcome back to Dermatology Weekly. It's time now for the Peer to Peer portion of our program. Remember, there are show notes available wherever notes are found in your particular listening app, they include downloadable PDFs to the relevant article discussed in this episode. And with that, please welcome the host of Peer to Peer, Dr. Vincent DeLeo. Today we're talking to Dr. Jason Wu and George Han about the latest guidelines for treatment of psoriasis with phototherapy. Can you both please introduce yourselves for our listeners? Hi, Jay Wu here, dermatologist. Hi, George Han, uh, dermatologist at Mount Sinai in New York City. 
Great, thank you both for joining us today. Okay, let's get started. Your article highlights some key takeaway points from the AAD NPF guidelines. Can you tell us which patients would be candidates for phototherapy for psoriasis, and on the other hand, who wouldn't be good candidates? Sure, so the original paper published in the JAD was a 30-page article, so we kind of distilled it down into a much shorter article in the CUTIS review. So in terms of candidates for uh, phototherapy, uh, actually, we didn't review, really review that, that much in detail in the original article, but I can certainly mention my my uh, recommendations for my own clinical practice. I'm going to focus more on narrowband UVB. So generally speaking, a good candidate for uh, phototherapy would be someone with uh, moderate to severe psoriasis and no psoriatic arthritis, because the phototherapy obviously is not going to improve the psoriatic arthritis. You know, in California, we have a lot of tree huggers. <laughs> So I'd say there's lots of patients that are actually worried about systemic therapies. They don't like oral medications. They don't like biologics. They want something natural. So I think phototherapy is a good option for these patients as well. And then lastly, people, uh, women who are pregnant, certainly they don't want to risk anything to the, to the baby. So many times they do prefer something like phototherapy. Uh, so guys, what, what kind of patients wouldn't be good candidates for phototherapy? I think uh, going on what Jay said, uh, it's important for us to screen all of our patients for psoriatic arthritis and joint symptoms and really take that seriously if we're initiating treatment because the last thing we want to do is start them on a treatment for their cutaneous psoriasis but really forget about what's going on inside. So I think in, in my mind at least that's the area where we, we probably really have to be very careful with phototherapy because it doesn't do anything for the joints and that is a destructive arthropathy. I think other things that we might think about are people obviously with any kind of inherited issues that might predispose them towards skin cancer such as xeroderma pigmentosum, but also people with a strong personal history of non-melanoma skin cancer that somebody we might think twice about putting under phototherapy. I'd just like to add Good. also from the guidelines, we also mentioned yep. that they've had a history of arsenic intake or exposure to ionizing radiation. They should also not receive phototherapy. Uh, just also a couple points. If they're on cyclosporin, say they have an organ transplant and they're on cyclosporin, I probably also would not give them phototherapy just because that may increase the risk of skin cancers. And then young children may not be able to tolerate office phototherapy, but certainly they could, they could do home phototherapy as well, if needed. Okay, so uh, what evidence should our listeners evaluate to select a particular phototherapy device for a patient? So we actually didn't mention this specifically in the guidelines, but I would like to mention that there are various uh, different types of phototherapy units. Of course, there's office phototherapy units, there's uh, home phototherapy units. Nowadays, in this COVID era, I actually do prefer home phototherapy much more, just because it's obviously easier for patients uh, to do it at home. They don't have to go, they don't have to be exposed to anyone in the office. Uh, in terms of home phototherapy units, I actually prefer the Clarify medical system. And so this is a, a really nice, uh, relatively new uh, system where they have a home phototherapy unit and they connect it with a, with a smartphone app. And so it's also cloud-based. So basically, the patients uh, can monitor their, their progress, and you can monitor their progress all through the app and through the cloud. So it's actually quite nice for patients uh, to be able to follow their, their own uh, phototherapy uh, progress, especially since psoriasis patients tend to be on the younger side. I think they're probably more amenable to using something that's app-based. I'll point. just add that uh, certainly we have been using more narrowband UVB devices over so broadband, for example. Uh, we do... I would echo what Jay said about the home phototherapy units. We've been using them a lot more and getting patients home phototherapy devices. And uh, it's, it's been really helpful. I do know about that Clarify system and it's great to be able to monitor the progress. I think one of the downsides to the traditional route where you go and get them a home phototherapy unit is that the patient actually <laughs> brings in this complicated grid and they get an assignment of a, uh, of a number where you have to go down a specific column on the grid to find out what their time is for a given dose of phototherapy. 
So I've had a lot of patients kind of confused about that, and uh, it could lead to negative outcomes in terms of uh, basically having too high of a dose or too low of a dose. So I think that is one thing that our technology is finally kind of caught up with what we need in practice and getting the treatment for the patients at home. Yeah, I like to voice my uh, support of what George said. I, I've certainly had my, my fair share of patients who also come with that very complicated grid, and then they're confused, and they may get a burn, and they feel like the psoriasis is not improving because they're getting too low of a dose. So I, I really feel that this uh, newer system may be helpful for, for patients in terms of dosing. So um, those are good points uh, in choosing devices. When you're going to start a patient on home or office phototherapy, what steps do you take before initiating the phototherapy? So as we mentioned before, phototherapy will not improve psoriatic arthritis. So it's really important to make sure they really do not have psoriatic arthritis. So if they do not, then I would proceed. And of course, you have to take a good history, make sure they don't have any history of any photosensitizing disorders, as we mentioned before. Make sure they don't have a history of melanoma or multiple skin cancers. Those are usually the main things I look for. Uh, in terms of uh, photosensitive medications, uh, that's also a concern potentially. Um, it's more of concern actually if they're going to get UVA, like PUVA. Um, so in theory, actually, uh, UVB phototherapy is relatively safer for those who are taking photosensitizing medications. But just to be on the safe side, I still will monitor for those as well. And I agree with those statements and, and those points uh, that Jay made. I'll just add that certainly in terms of narrow band UVB, if we do have a patient on it, with the medication that's on our list of photosensitizing medications, oftentimes we'll just start them at a lower dose. And so if they're like, for example, skin type two, we'll start them on the skin type one dose instead. Uh, we do mention the uh, MED versus just starting based on skin type. I think certainly while the MED is helpful in getting some numbers and uh, guiding the treatment, for the most part, we do start patients just based on their Fitzpatrick skin type, and uh, we, we take a conservative approach towards the starting dosages. All good points. Uh, so you started the patient. Uh, what do you recommend when you've achieved resolution, or what is resolution in the patient uh, on phototherapy? Many times patients will get very clear, sometimes 100% clear, and for, for these patients, once they're satisfied with their level of improvement, they may want to start tapering down the, uh, the phototherapy. So in the, during the induction phase, they'll oftentimes get it two or three times a week, preferably three times a week. And then once they're clear, then they can start reducing it down to once a, twice a week for four weeks, and then once a week for four weeks. And then they can get that, uh, that dosing every week. And then usually they, it's preferred for them to have this, the last uh, maintain their same level of millijoules uh, as given on the last dose before they were clear. So basically, you don't want to increase them once they're on the maintenance dose, and they just have the hold constant on their, on their current dose. Yeah, and I think that uh, long-term maintenance is often a question that we get, and certainly we have patients that we maintain on every week or every two weeks. Uh, you do have to be careful, especially with the two weeks, that that cannot be too high of a dose. And that's why the guidelines recommend that you go with a 25% or, or so lower dose than the original maintenance dosage. Because each time that patient is now less um, sensitized to having the UV exposed to them. So you got to be careful with those longer dosing regimens to not go too high on the dosage. Right. And then for right. my own clinical experience, Many times patients will also want to just take a break in the summertime because they feel like if they're going to be outside anyway, sometimes that's enough to kind of keep the psoriasis away. And that's fine. I, many times I will just say, okay, we'll come back in the fall or the winter whenever you feel the psoriasis is starting to come back. So we've talked about uh, who, to, who to treat with phototherapy, what to use, and once you get them clear, uh, what to maintain them on. So let's look at the other side. What are some of the common side effects that you might see in patients with phototherapy? Some common side effects I would see would be uh, maybe a tan for some patients, maybe some new sunspots for patients. Rarely we will have a patient get an actual sunburn, and that's obviously a, a, something more on our fault, most likely. 
so for those patients, we really have to counsel them well, and um, we really have to lower their dose or just stop it completely until they're recovered. And then, obviously, when they do return uh, for the phototherapy, we have to put them at a much lower dose so they do not get a sunburn again, because we know that sunburns are a risk for skin cancers such as melanoma. Non-melanoma skin cancers and AKs are theoretical risks. A lot of the studies seem to indicate that patients can have hundreds and hundreds of sessions of phototherapy and do not have a higher risk of skin cancers. But certainly that's something that we still have to monitor for patients. Yeah, and I think that just to echo what, what Jay said, the documentation really is key when you're doing phototherapy. And that's one of the nice things about some of the newer phototherapy units is that they'll actually be linked up to a computer control that automatically keeps the treatment record. And it's, it's kind of dummy proof in some ways because I know that if you have a patient who's not been there for at least a week, uh, the system will actually give you a stop and tell you that this patient is at a risk of a burn if you don't bring their dosage down. So I think that's an important thing. Another example of how some, finally the technology is catching up with us and, and helping us prevent these negative outcomes. Uh, certainly, we don't use PUVA much anymore. And in terms of those, those really bad like lentigenes and those side effects, we see less of that certainly with the narrow band UVB. But those are, if you still use PUVA, that might be something that uh, you may see more of. Uh, all good. Uh, in in the article, you guys, you do discuss localized treatments briefly, like hand and foot disease. Uh, can you touch on that in your practices or what you would recommend for our listeners? Right. So sometimes you can buy a dedicated hand and foot uh, devices, but I would recommend having more of an eczema laser because the eczema laser can be used for hands and feet of course but you can also use it for localized areas on other parts of the body no, i agree completely we we use a lot of eczema lasers for those those areas and it does seem to be more rapidly effective and uh, patients do like it most of the newer eczema lasers are actually quite fast so the treatment doesn't last very long um, so that's been very helpful for us, kind of supplanting the hand foot units in a lot of cases. So uh, we're all living through COVID, and you guys have uh, touched briefly on the difference, uh, the differences that are occurring in practices because of COVID. Just want to reiterate any of those things you've discussed. I know this is a talk about phototherapy, but uh, we do have uh, update guidelines from the AED, the MPF, and the IPC. Most all of these different organizations do say that if the patient does not have COVID-19 or and they do not have symptoms, they do not necessarily need to stop their biologic therapy or their systemic therapy. I think that's a major misconception that I've seen in many uh, uh, in the community practice that I'll have patients come to me saying, "Oh, they're worried about COVID and they they're on uh, biologic and their their dermatologist stopped them." Uh, from continuing, and then now they're flaring. So that, that's a concern, I think. So I, I really want to reiterate that if they do not have COVID-19 and they're not at risk for getting COVID-19, they're younger, they don't have diabetes, such as those risk factors, they do not need to stop their systemic therapy. Yeah, definitely. We, uh, we have counseled our patients to stay on. That being said, a lot of patients, for the reasons that uh, we outlined before, the ones who are on phototherapy and want to continue on it, we've been able to reopen our phototherapy unit rather quickly. And just like with any other aspect of our lives now, you just have to clean more and more often and more intensely. And so we just take that into account. A lot of frequent cleaning after every patient goes into the phototherapy unit. It's a personal decision, really, when you think about it. I mean, Jay outlined it very well in terms of the risks of biologics and whatnot. There's a risk to traveling two to three times a week to come to a doctor's office, coming in and maybe sitting in the waiting room and going into the area as well. So that's something that we also heard from our patients that actually guided them away from phototherapy. So I think it's gone both ways. Uh, certainly, having the availability of the home phototherapy devices has been helpful for us as well. Uh, so between those, as long as we're able to continue our care of the patients, I think it's important, but we should do so based on guidelines and science and, and not so much on fear. A really great summary, guys. Uh, this has been a very, very interesting and important discussion. 
And I recommend all of our readers go to your article because it is an extensive but a very shortened review of guidelines for the use of phototherapy in psoriasis. We thank you very much for joining us. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, like <laughs> a... <laughs> no, I think that's I think I'm good for now. I think I made the point that uh, it's really important to have patients continue their systemic therapies if they do not have COVID or are at low risk for developing COVID-19. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's just important that we get our patients access to care in some way or another. I think between figuring out really if they want to come in, if they don't, if we can reach out to them via telemedicine, however we can make sure that they get uninterrupted care to prevent those morbidities and those issues that might come with non-treatment, we really ought to be doing everything we can. So I've had the whole gamut during this time, patients who come in wanting to switch therapy, patients who have lost their job, lost insurance, who we've had to get onto free drug programs, who we've had to do charity kind of care and phototherapy, things like that with, you know, there's, there's, everything's kind of coming out of the woodwork and, and we just have to, I think, be flexible and really know and understand the options to provide the best care for our patients. Beautiful. Uh, thank you guys again, and have a good day. Thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 86 of Dermatology Weekly. Dermatology Weekly is produced by MD Edge editors Elizabeth Meshkani and Melissa Sears. The news portion of the program is written and recorded by myself, Nick Andrews. It's produced by Elizabeth Meshkani. The peer-to-peer portion of the program is hosted by Dr. Vincent DeLeo. Show notes are authored by Melissa Sears and Alicia Sunners. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by our executive editor, Kathy Scarbeck. You're listening to MD Edge. Thank you.